you have not seen Veritas' video about being a Christian apologist, he discusses the purpose behind Christian apologetics and the manner in which Christian apologetics should be conducted. And this video response will be about my thoughts on the apologist's counterpart. That is, um, it will be about the purpose of those who discuss skepticism of theism and about the manner in which skepticism is conducted. Veritas mentioned that the reason that he um, is a Christian apologist, uh, apologist is that he cares about what happens to people's souls. And I'll just add here that I feel that for anyone who accepts the premise that the Bible contains text that's authorized by the creator of the universe, and that the creator of the universe wants us to do um, such and such in order to gain salvation, uh, then I feel that being a proselytizer slash apologist is um, almost the only humane response. Uh, to draw something of a parallel situation, um, I would think that if I somehow knew an asteroid was going to destroy my hometown, and for whatever reason, um, many of my family members and neighbors refused to recognize the truth of this pending disaster, I would hope I would have the humane decency to dedicate a fair portion of my time to convincing people that this threat was real. Um, now, I recognize that's not a perfect analogy, um, but still, my main point is that given the Christian's premise, I think saving souls is a completely understandable and even commendable goal, um, and it's one that probably unifies many, if not most, Christian apologists uh, and proselytizers. Um, now, when we get to the purpose of being a skeptic of theism, I feel that we don't have um, any near equivalent. There's no real um, unity of purpose. Um, for example, some people speak out of religion just because they feel it's such a great source of harm. Uh, Sam Harris, for example, said he started um, writing his End of Faith book on September 12th, 2001. Um, and some of these skeptics feel direct legal oppression from religion, uh, such as the gay couples in America who can't get married, and teachers who feel that scripture is tying their hands when it comes tr uh, to trying to teach their students science. Um, some critics just feel they need to unleash their anger about uh, the damage done to them by religion, such as uh, childhood nightmares about the tortures from demons awaiting them in hell. Um, now, in Veritas's video, he, um, he adds that some people practice Christian apologetics primarily to flaunt their intellect. Uh, and that's certainly true of some skeptics as well. Um, or at least flaunting their intellect is a nice bonus of whatever their other um, higher purpose is. Um, and some people criticize religion just because of the, they feel like it brings them great entertainment value. Uh, some just love the rudeness aspect of attacking religion. Uh, they love seeing the shocked reaction that can come when you insult something that, at least historically, has so often been treated reverently. Um, and some skeptics will add that it's important to attack religion irreverently. Now, these people are generally not trying to change theists' minds, but they just want to issue um, a rallying cry for non-believers and to say that it's uh, time to stop giving religion such unwarranted, undeserved respect. Um, now, some skeptics are just trying to figure out the answers for themselves about why the world is the way it is. And in discussing why they find religion's answers unsatisfying, they seek and often find answers from the secular world that are satisfying. And by satisfying answers, I don't mean those that are necessarily comforting, um, but instead answers that can give, um, that can explain a wide set of observations and make predictions that agree with observations. Or in other words, answers that help make sense out of life. And to some extent, that's what's led to my own study of religion um, and what ended up as skepticism of religion. Uh, and in my case, I think the real spark was the frustration that I felt at my inarticulateness when it came to trying to respond to Christian proselytizers. And especially um, as a teenager, I felt that the Christian's arguments didn't make sense, uh, but I had a difficult time in pinpointing the flaws of their arguments. And this eventually led me to um, organize, in writing, uh, my thoughts on the subject. Anyway, that's certainly not an exhaustive list of why people speak out against religion. But I do hope that it shows um, at least that there's some diversity, a good amount of diversity in the purpose. And this diversity complicates the other topic of Veritas's that I want to discuss, and that has to do with behavior. Uh, Veritas suggested that when it comes to how apologists 
should carry out their efforts. They should hold themselves, hold themselves up to the standard set by Jesus Christ. Because even though Christ suffered tremendously, he never resorted to hateful or negative behavior, but his reaction was always that of gentleness and dignity, uh, respect, love, and compassion. Now, when it comes to skeptics, we're not united under a common purpose. And that also means there's little chance of there being um, one role model that we would ever agree upon. Um, but for that subcategory of skeptics who do share the common goal of trying to get theists to change their mind, there is um, a wealth of literature available um, when it comes to uh, the subject of the art of persuasion. So I'd like to now uh, share a few passages from one such book, and that's uh, Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. Um, that's a fairly old book published uh, in the 1930s. Um, old as far as pop psychology goes. Anyway, the very uh, first chapter talks about the common urge to harshly criticize and condemn others. Uh, I'm going to quote here. Criticism is dangerous because it wounds a person's precious pride, hurts his, sense of, hurts his sense of importance, and arouses resentment. Criticism puts a person on the defensive and usually just makes him strive to justify himself. If you and I want to stir up a resentment tomorrow that may rankle across the decades and endure until death, just let us indulge in a little stinging criticism, no matter how certain we are that it is justified. Uh, and next comes my um, favorite sentence in the whole book. When dealing with people, let us remember we are not dealing with creatures of logic. We are dealing with creatures of emotion, creatures bristling with prejudices and motivated by pride and vanity. Um, in the book's chapter called A Sure Way of Making Enemies and How to Avoid It, Carnegie asks, well, what happens after we've told the person that they're wrong, especially in a derogatory way? Carnegie writes, Do you make them want to agree with you? No, for you have struck a blow at their intelligence, judgment, pride, and self-respect. That will make them want to strike back. You may then hurl at them all the logic of Plato, but you will not alter their opinions, for you have hurt their feelings. Uh, and he then writes that if you begin by announcing, I'm going to prove so-and-so to you, that's like saying, I'm smarter than you are, I'm going to tell you a thing or two and make you change your mind. That is a challenge. It arouses opposition and makes the listener want to battle with you before you even start. It is difficult, even under the most benign conditions, to change people's minds. So, why make it harder? Why handicap yourself? Uh, and a little later in the chapter, uh, Carnegie writes, When we are wrong, we may admit it to ourselves. And if we are handled gently and tactfully, we may admit it to others and even take pride in our frankness and broad-mindedness but not if someone else is trying to ram the unpalatable fact down our esophagus. Now, as for, one, as for how one could discuss skepticism of theism without directly telling theists they're wrong, uh, I outlined this in my video series called Using the Socratic Method with Christian Proselytizers. Um, for those who haven't watched it, I'll just give a very high-level overview. First, I tentatively, tentatively accept, uh, at least for argument's sake, several of the Christian's premises. Um, First, I accept the premise that there is some sort of creator. Uh, second, that this set, said creator has made some sort of um, effort to communicate with humans. And then I'll also accept the Christian's premise that one religion really came from God and all those other religions, those other tens of thousands, um, those are just made up by people. Second, the proselytizer and I review a number of sacred texts from non-Christian religions. And my aim is to get the Christian to pinpoint the telltale signs of human authorships of these foreign faiths, uh, and specifically by three criteria. That they're pieced together from pre-existing religions, that their holy laws are based on, often based at least, on irrational prejudices, and their stories contain earthbound descriptions of the universe, uh, such as describing, uh, describing the stars as tiny, and the sun is orbiting the earth, and the moon is shining its own light. Uh, and then we then turn to Christianity, turn to examining Christianity by the same light that was just held up to non-Christian religions. Now, as far as I can tell, the Bible contains all those same telltale signs of purely human authorship, but I am opening, open to hearing why my conclusion is wrong. Um, and again, you can find all the details in my video series called Using the Socratic Method with Christian Proselytizers. Uh, thank you for watching.